at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Known for groundbreaking research, teaching, and medical care. Hello and welcome to another Johns Hopkins Medicine Facebook Live. I'm Dr. Ness Matthew Dacus and I'm an endocrinologist specializing in diabetes care and research here at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Today we're going to be talking about diabetes. This is a common uh, condition which is uh, a disease that results from an impairment in the body's ability to either produce or respond to the hormone insulin uh, and that leads to um, high levels of glucose in the blood which can have uh, long-term consequences. And I'm uh, pleased to be joined by two of my colleagues, Dr. Risa Wolf, a pediatric endocrinologist, and Dr. Tom Donner, an adult uh, diabetes specialist. Dr. Wolf, let's start with you. Tell us about the three main types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a relatively rare autoimmune disorder where the person's own immune system attacks the cells of the pancreas that make insulin. Type 2 diabetes is a form of insulin resistance. And gestational diabetes, which is related to pregnancy, is something that we'll discuss at another time. Dr. Donner, what's the most common <coughs> form of diabetes? That's the, uh, the most common form by far is type 2 diabetes. This represents 90 to 95 percent of people in the, in the population. And type 2 diabetes is the reason why we're seeing such an increase in diabetes. We've seen a doubling of the rate of diabetes in the last 20 years, and it's now 11% of the U.S. population that has diabetes. That's 34 million patients. Mm. Um, and we care about that because diabetes, as you know, is a significant risk factor for heart attacks, strokes, kidney disease, uh, and vision loss. Yeah, so we typically think of, of type 2 diabetes as a disease of, of adults. Um, Dr. Wolf, are you seeing kids with type 2 diabetes? Yes, approximately 5 to 10 percent of the patients that we see with diabetes have type 2 diabetes. Um, in the last two decades, we have seen a significant increase in the number of type 2 diabetes in children that has been coincident with the obesity epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, this typically affects children in their teenage years, uh, children who have a family history of diabetes, and unfortunately dis disproportionately affects our minority youth. So what are some signs that parents should watch for um, for uh, if their kids may be displaying some signs or symptoms of type 2 diabetes? Parents should look for children that are drinking a lot, urinating more frequently. An easy way to tell is if they're getting up at night to use the bathroom when they had not been doing that previously, if they're more fatigued, have some in unintended weight loss. And in type 2 diabetes, they might often notice a darkening around the neck that is a, something called acanthosis nigricans that can be another sign of type 2 diabetes. So Dr. Donner, we're seeing a lot of research that shows that people with diabetes who get COVID-19 may have sev more severe cases or not do as well as those who, who don't have diabetes. Why is that the case? Yes, yeah, so diabetes is among one of the conditions that put patients at higher risk for a, a worse outcome from COVID-19, and it's, it's a multifactorial reason, so um, a lot of reasons. The first is that uh, when blood sugar levels are uncontrolled when they're high, especially when blood sugar levels are higher than 180, the immune system doesn't function as well, and therefore it can't fight the infection as well. As you know, COVID-19 is an infection, and if the immune system, your own immune system, is not fighting that infection well, then a more severe infection can occur. Uh, also, pa patients with diabetes also tend to be overweight, and we know that overweight and obesity puts you at higher risk for a bad outcome from diabetes. Uh, many diabetes patients are, over, uh, are older, and we know that older patients uh, don't do as well, and many patients with diabetes can have heart and kidney disease, and if you have heart and kidney disease, um, uh, then you tend also not to do as well if you get a COVID-19 infection. Okay, interesting. <coughs> And so all the more reason to get, get diabetes under good control at this, at this point in time if, if you've got uh, diabetes. Um, Dr. Wolf, could you tell us a little bit about your research related to diabetes? Yes, thank you for the opportunity. So I just want to share a little bit about some of the work that we're doing at the Pediatric Diabetes Center. And this relates to some research projects that are uh, related to innovative care technologies for children with diabetes. So. One of the two projects I'll talk about is um, a way that we've been improving diabetic retinopathy screening. So as you mentioned earlier, one of the risks for of having diabetes is that you can have vision loss. Uh, but we know that screening for diabetic retinopathy can prevent this. Unfortunately, only about 50% of children 
are screened for diabetic retinopathy. Um, and if you're from an underserved community, you're even more likely, unlikely to be screened, mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately more likely to have diabetic retinopathy. So in 2018, when the FDA approved the first uh, artificial intelligence-based algorithm for diabetic retinopathy screening, we implemented that in our pediatric diabetes center and were the first uh, to do so. And in the pilot study, we screened over 300 kids. We showed that it was safe to use this technology in pediatrics. We also improved our screening rates from 49 to 95%. Um, but we were also able to identify children who had diabetic retinopathy and, and refer them to eye care providers for earlier treatment. Um, another study that we're doing uh, is related to the use of continuous glucose monitors, which many children with type 1 diabetes use, and a lot of adults with type 2 diabetes use for care of their diabetes. Um, and this serves as a substitute to finger stick blood sugar checks, uh, where you wear a monitor that will continuously read your blood sugars um, for 10 to 14 days, depending on the monitor that you're using. Well, we know in pediatrics that our minority youth are less likely to use diabetes technology such as DGMs. So in a study looking at um, ways to imp improve this and increase uptake of uh, CGM use um, in our community, uh, we are giving out complementary trial use of a CGM for at-risk children, so that includes children from underserved communities who are poorly controlled, and with the goal to see if they will increase their uptake of CGM use, which we know is associated with improved glycemic control or better diabetes outcomes. Mm -hmm. Interesting, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. You, you really have been leading the, uh, the efforts ac across Hopkins in terms of the um, retinal screening with the, uh, the artificial intelligence technology. And, uh, it turns out I think that that's one of the first FDA approved AI technologies in in medicine, period. Isn't that right? It is. Yeah. It is the first so AI ever to be approved for use in medicine. So it's really exciting. Um, Dr. Donner, you've also had some really exciting uh, discoveries in, in uh, your research this year, including um, a publication in uh, the prestigious journal Cell um, around type 1 diabetes. I wonder if you could share a little bit about your uh, recent findings. Thank you. Yeah, so when I first arrived to Hopkins, I uh, started collaborating with the immunology group uh, headed by Dr. Abdel Hamad, um, who are looking at the cells in the immune system that cause type 1 diabetes. And so many of my patients and also uh, many of Dr. Wolf's patients have given blood samples for that study. And so um, uh, by looking at these immune cells, uh, an interesting finding was found that there's a very small population of these cells uh, found in, in uh, essentially all patients with type 1 diabetes that are much higher in number than people without diabetes. And it turned out that this cell type is, uh, was previously unknown. It's a, it's a cell that has properties of both uh, two different types of, of immune cells called B and T cells. It has uh, properties of both. And so it's been called the X cell or the crossover cell because it has properties of both. And uh, there are uh, s certain structures on that cell that make it look as though it may be the cause of type 1 diabetes. And so mm. the two years worth of, of, uh, of work was uh, put into that one publication. It was a landmark publication and we have uh, since continued to study that cell um, and have created an antibody. Uh, an antibody is something that targets a, a very particular part of the cell, attaches onto it, and does two things. Number one, we can identify that cell much better with this antibody. Number two is we are hopeful that antibody can in inactivate or destroy that cell. And if it's only destroying that cell that's responsible for type 1 diabetes, this, this technology potentially holds promise for preventing type 1 diabetes from ever happening, which well, would obviously be a major, major advance. Yeah, huge, huge break, breakthrough and a, I think a major advance towards ultimately a cure uh, for type 1 diabetes. So. Um, Really exciting work. Um, ho hopefully, it c continues to progress uh, in, in a positive direction. Um, so, you know, we we have been seeing um, during this COVID pandemic um, uh, issues related to diabetes care uh, generally in the patients that we serve, both in pediatrics and in adult um, diabetes and. Uh, many of the communities are around uh, the Hopkins Hospital are underserved communities and we're really seeing a racial disparities in care, um, generally COVID care and diabetes care and in the, in the intersection of the two. Um, 
I'll, I'll share some of my experiences at just managing um, patients with type 2 during this pandemic. It's been incredibly uh, challenging. Um, you know, I think COVID has really affected the psychological well-being of everybody, um, but it's, it, uh, it's particularly challenging for people who are managing a chronic disease like, like diabetes that requires so much attention and self-care and, you know, blood glucose monitoring and medication adherence. And I've seen in my patients over the last few months um, during our telemedicine visits or in-person visits, how much the emotional burden of, of, of this pandemic has, has affected their diabetes uh, self-care. So anxiety is, depression rates have gone up in the, in the general population, but also in our patients with diabetes. And sometimes during the visits, just kind of talking about that um, and uh, we're just ha having our patients uh, talk through the, the challenges, um, you know, the fears of p potentially contracting COVID or uh, you know, a lo loved ones who may have, have gotten it, um, helps them to sort of reset and, and prioritize uh, their own care. Um, COVID's also made it really challenging in terms of physical activity. People are, especially during these lockdowns, have uh, not been able to get to the gym, not, not been able to do their usual physical activity, and that's uh, had a big impact on uh, glycemic control. Um, and then, of course, nutrition. Uh, so, you know, people are eating out more as a result of the stress. It's more convenient. Um, they're not able to make the same healthy choices that they usually do. And so it's, um, it's really important that during our, our visits, we reinforce sort of healthy uh, food choices to manage uh, diabetes. I will say that the one uh, sort of silver lining throughout all of this is the role of telemedicine and diabetes care. Um, I think it's been transformative for me as a provider. Um, and hopefully it's something that stays with us uh, when, when COVID is over. Just being able to check in um, at frequent intervals, it's very convenient to meet somebody via video, see their blood glucose data using a CGM that Dr. Wolf had talked about earlier and uh, making adjustments and then checking back in, in in two weeks and as frequently as needed until we're under control has actually in, in many ways improved care, I think. Um, so uh, I, I do think that that's one positive aspect, uh, despite you know um, the challenges that COVID has uh, created for diabetes. I don't know if either of you have any comments about the management of diabetes throughout all of this. I can <clears throat> I can comment first. No, I agree. Um, with telemedicine at Hopkins, we've um, we transitioned pretty quickly, didn't we, uh, to to get people up and uh, running, uh, both us and our patients, and uh, now we have nutrition visits that can be done online. We can have nursing education that can be done uh, via telemedicine and all. And that's, that actually has been a big improvement because it's a big time commitment for patients to come in for visits. Um, and especially our patients who live far away from uh, Hopkins, it's been a big convenience, even though we do like to see our patients in person every once in a while. Yeah, for sure. I think we've had a very similar experience in pediatrics. And even on the first day of the stay at home, we were already doing telemedicine. Um, as we actually had been doing it before for families who lived on the Eastern Shore, and it's a three hour drive each way. Yeah. So we were doing it even for diabetes care. Um, but I think that that system that we had set up prior to COVID actually helped us transition so rapidly to doing it for diabetes care even after COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the interesting questions that's come up in the pediatric diabetes community is whether COVID 19 has impacted uh, diagnoses of diabetes. Um, or the severity of uh, new onset diabetes or just uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, um, which is a complication of diabetes. And um, there are national groups that are looking at multi-center data to assess whether there truly are some trends. Um, we personally in our, in our division felt that there was quite uh, a few more uh, diagnoses towards the end of the first wave of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually looked at our data uh, this year in 2020 compared to the prior four years during that four month period. And what we did find that, that there was a greater proportion of known type one diabetes patients admitted in DKA mm -hmm. during that period compared to the prior four years. Mm -hmm. uh, 
While we did see an, a slight increase in the numbers of new onset diabetes, it was not statistically significant, so we can't say that there were any trends, and we think that uh, longer longitudinal multicenter data will further elucidate uh, whether there actually are any trends in or increases in the new onset diabetes. Uh, we've also taken a look at our type 2 uh, in youth population during this time. And we looked at children who had, had who had been diagnosed with type 2 before the pandemic and how they fared during this time. Um, and, and really based on our own clinical experience and that we felt that you know, the children were more sedentary, they were doing virtual school, they weren't doing a lot of activity, some food insecurity, not eating as healthy as you mentioned. And it felt like a lot of the children were gaining weight at home. And actually when we ran, um, when we looked at the, our patient population, we actually did not see a change in weight, but we did see a significant worsening of hemoglobin A1C or glycemic control, uh, you know, which is quite concerning to us and really just highlights the importance of the very frequent touch points and making sure that we are connected to our families mm -hmm. on a very regular basis to try and help them through this difficult time. Dr. Wolf, you mentioned that uh, there have been increased rates of a condition called DKA during the COVID pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit about what DKA is? Yes, DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis is a condition that occurs uh, typically in people with type one diabetes where your blood sugars get very high and acids build up in your blood. Um, and it generally requires hospitalization and intensive care level treatment uh, to manage it. Yeah, so interesting. So the, I just wanna comment on your, um, your findings of just increased um, rates of DKA in, in the pediatric population. I believe that those findings have been confirmed in, in other um, healthcare settings outside the U U.S. and sort of does raise the question about whether the coronavirus is it playing a role in triggering an immune response, perhaps. I know we need longer term data and larger, larger studies for that. And then the issue about glycemic control, I think one of the things that we've also observed is um, a, a big decrease in the number of people getting their A1C checked throughout this uh, COVID pandemic. And, um, and, and I think that's a problem. Uh, you know, rates of cardiovascular disease have gone up. People are um, not getting the care that they need for chronic diseases like diabetes, which is linked to, to other adverse uh, outcomes. So just encourage our patients to um, make an effort to get to the lab and, and keep, um, keep up with the diabetes quality um, measures that are so important uh, to their care. Um, so I wanna thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Wolf and Dr. Donna for, for talking today. It's always great to talk to you uh, both and I'm, I'm glad we could find a little bit of time to um, sh share our thoughts about this important topic. Uh, and to our viewers, thank you for watching. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, and we encourage you to follow Johns Hopkins Medicine here on Facebook and other social media platforms. And to learn more, adult patients uh, can visit hopkinsmedicine.org. And for pediatric needs, uh, please visit hopkinschildren.org or call us toll free from anywhere in the US at 410-464-6713. Thanks again and stay safe and healthy everybody.